in Monticello, Virginia, sits the estate of Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence and therefore the articulator of the American idea. Looking at Jefferson's original bust of John Adams, as he was, in the room where he passed away. On July 4th, 1826, 50 years to the day of American independence. For me, who had the privilege of visiting, this was a memorable moment, but not the most memorable. The most meaningful experience at Monticello took place in the grave on Jefferson's estate. This was not Jefferson's grave, rather this is a grave of someone a lot less famous. There is a Jewish grave on the estate of the third president of the United States. Boldly emblazoned on the Matseva, the gravestone, are the words Rachel Phillips Levy died 7th of ER in Monticello. We know very little about the woman who was buried there, but we know a great deal about her father, Jonas Phillips, and about her son, Commodore Uriah Phillips Levy. And we will be using the saga of the Phillips family as a lens by which to see both the extraordinary and unique nature of the Jewish experience in America, as well as the impact of Jewish ideas on America's founding. The Tikva Fund presents Jewish Ideas and the American Founders. Jewish Ideas and the American Founders is dedicated by Alan K. Schwartz in memory of his wife, Barbara R. Schwartz, and in tribute to all Jewish Americans, both strangers and neighbors, and is supported by the Zahava and Moshe L. Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought at Yeshiva University. Welcome to the Tikva Fund study of Jewish thought and the founding of the United States. Our aim is to illuminate defining features of the American constitutional order by shining the lights of Jewish experience and Jewish ideas onto its earliest and most consequential moments. From the March to Independence and the Revolutionary War to the ratification debate and the birth of religious freedom. From Charleston, South Carolina to Philadelphia to New York, I invite you to think together with us about Jewish ideas and the American founders. My name is Jonathan Silver from the Tikva Fund, and together with Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik, our teacher and guide, we'll combine history with theology and politics to uncover the exceptional way that America combines modern and biblical ideas, contract with covenant, faith with freedom, equality with pluralism. Meir Soloveitchik is the rabbi of Congregation Sheriff Israel the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue founded in New York in 1654. He's the congregation's 10th minister since the American Revolution. Rabbi Soloveitchik has long nursed a passion for American political thought, and his sermons and speeches, like his writing in the Wall Street Journal, Mosaic, and Commentary, have refined and enlarged the patriotic citizenship of Jewish and non-Jewish readers alike. Rabbi Soloveitchik, in this first lecture, we're going to meet some of the figures that propel the story forward. Can you just explain who we're going to meet? Well, we'll be meeting uh, one of my favorite people, a man by the name of Jonas Phillips, who in the lecture I refer to as the first truly American Jew. Uh, along the way, we'll also make brief reference to a couple other central characters uh, in the story we're going to tell, uh, including uh, George Washington, uh, Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and the most famous physician in America, and two of Jonas Phillips' grandchildren, Mordecai Manuel Noah and Uriah Phillips Levy. And how did you originally discover the Phillips family and Jonas Phillips himself? I uh, discovered Jonas Phillips in an article by um, Michael McConnell. In the course of this article, McConnell makes reference to what he calls the first uh, court case in American legal history, raising a religious liberty questions following the passage of the First Amendment. And this was about a Jew by the name of Jonas Phillips, who in 1791 uh, refused to testify in court on Saturday because it was his Shabbat. And I was immediately struck by this, and I thought, well, who is this Jew whose 
living in Philadelphia in 1791 and cares so much about the Shabbat that he refuses to come to court. What lit up in you that made you wanted to pursue it? My own interest in Jewish ideas and the American founders comes from my grandfather, who was a Rosh Hashiva of Aaron Soloveitchik, who went to law school and was a very proud American and believed that American ideas at their best were fundamentally uh, Jewish ideas. And uh, to him, what Jews owed America was not just to contribute to the society as Americans, but to contribute it as Jews, to bring Jewish ideas to American society, to criticize America in the name of Judaism when we feel that America is not rising to the occasion morally and not living up to its own ideals. This is the role model with which I was raised. Rabbi Soloveitchik, what would you like your Jewish viewers to take away from the lecture series? And what would you like your non-Jewish viewers to take away? I want both Jewish and non-Jewish viewers to take away the lesson that the Jewish experience in America highlights the uniqueness of the American conception of religious liberty. Because that conception, to some extent, is under threat today. We need to be able to show, in defending it, how it was one of the central principles of the American founding. Jews, I'm hoping, will take away another lesson as well, which is a sense of obligation in the way they live their lives, as strangers and as neighbors. As strangers, if religious observance is so easy in America today, are we taking advantage of it? Are we living the fullest Jewish lives that we can live? And as neighbors, are we merely benefiting from America or are we benefiting it? And benefiting it means, first and foremost, ensuring that America remains loyal to its founding principles and bringing Jewish ideas to general society. America, land of opportunity, the golden of Medina. So many stories describe the penniless, uneducated immigrant who gets off the boat and makes it big. Perhaps no anecdote is as celebrated as the tale of the janitor of the Bialystoker synagogue. As the story goes, a Jew gets off the boat in the 1920s, is living in tenement in the Lower East Side, has no marketable skills, and so he gets a job as the janitor at a shul there, the Bialystoker Synagogue. First day on the job, delivery arrives, and they say to him, please read and sign here for the delivery. He says, I'm sorry, I just arrived from Europe. I don't know how to read or write English. I can't sign. President of the shul hears about this and says, I'm sorry, this is your main job, is receiving packages, and so we're going to have to let you go. He's fired. He needs to support his family, so he gets a push cart selling pins and needles. Turns out he has a knack for sales. Does very well. Soon he has two push carts, then three push carts, then a store, then two stores, then five stores. And 20 years down the road, he is the owner of the second largest sewing supplies company in America, which is about to be bought out and merged with the largest sewing supplies company in America. Sitting in the office of the corporate lawyers and investment bankers, the lawyers bring over the papers and they say, Sir, congratulations, you're about to become an incredibly wealthy man. Here are the merger papers. Please read and sign here. He says, Sorry, I don't know how to read or write English. I can't read it. So his lawyers look at him and they say, Sir, this is unbelievable. You who have achieved so much in America, you don't even know how to read or write English. Can you imagine what you would be today if you knew how to read and write English? And he says, Yeah, I'd be the janitor at the Bialystoker Synagogue. <laughs> now, this story has long been told as a joke, but the historical annals of one community contains a true tale that is its parallel. When a Jew known as Jonas Phillips arrived in colonial America, he was destitute with no prospects, no family relations, and no obvious marketable skills. With little opportunity, he found an initial job, not as a janitor, but as the shochet, the ritual slaughterer, at a synagogue known as Congregation Sherith Israel in New York. Happens to be my synagogue. By the end of his life, Jonas Phillips was one of the wealthiest and most prominent Jews in the United States a good friend of American statesmen, and without question, a patriarch of one of its most important Jewish families. 
But this man's story is not just about one who came to America and made it big. Rather, for this man in contrast, unfortunately, in contrast to many, many others, this man remained staunchly loyal to his faith, even as he was loyal to his new nation. And he never saw the giving up of Torah observance as the proper price paid for success. And in fact, as we shall see, he became the first advocate for religious liberty in this new nation. He is the most important American Jew that many of you have never heard of. And today I hope to recommend his example to all of us. By reading two important letters that he wrote, and by studying one other episode in his life, we will be able to understand the significance of his saga and the unique inspiration and obligation that his life's example embodies for us all. So let's summarize the basic fact of Jonas Phillips' biography. Jonas Phillips was an Ashkenazi Jew born in Germany in 1736, where he had become the trained and qualified shochet. He arrives in Charleston, South Carolina in 1756, deeply in debt, the indentured servant of another Jew. After three years of working for him, Philip secured his freedom and made his way to Albany, New York. The French and Indian War was ongoing, and here Philip saw opportunity. He opened a store intending to sell goods to British troops, but the store soon went bankrupt, and perhaps seeking better connections, he came to New York. And there, he took two steps in order to make it in New York society. First, Jonas Phillips joined the Freemasons, an organization in which many of America's elite were members. Second, Jonas Phillips knew what was essential for social mobility for an Ashkenazi Jew in colonial America. He married a Sephardi. And he secured an invitation to one of America's most celebrated Jewish women. Rebecca Mendez Machado was the daughter of David Mendez Machado, the Chazan, the minister at Sherith Israel, my predecessor. And Rebecca was renowned for her intelligence and her character and her beauty. Here I quote the Sephardic American historian Henry Samuel Moraes. Rebecca, he wrote, was in appearance the true specimen of a Sephardi. Were it not known that she was Jewish, he wrote, she, quote, might be mistaken for a bell of sunny Andalusia, end quote. As one other historian puts it, Rebecca's marriage to Jonas Phillips is emblematic of the melding of Sephardic and Ashkenazic families in colonial America, a process accelerated by the outnumbering of Sephardim by Ashkenazim by the 1720s. For Jonas, marriage to Rebecca would have symbolized social upward mobility, since Sephardim were associated with nobility and culture, while conversely, many 18th century Sephardim scorned German Jews as ill-bred and uncouth. Perceptions of social inferiority also help explain why Jonas and so many other Ashkenazim of his time period adopted a Sephardic identity by marrying Sephardic women and adopting the Sephardic rite. End quote. So having married well, Jonas Phillips now sought to make it as a merchant in New York, but fell into debt again. And so in 1765, perhaps through marital connections, he secured a position as the shochet of his community, in which capacity he served until 1769, after which he returned to trading with little success while remaining a deeply involved member of his congregation. In 1776, revolution broke out, and with British troops converging on Manhattan, the Jews in Sherith Israel began to debate exactly what they should do. Phillips was deeply loyal to the Patriot cause. In the words of his grandson, Jonas Phillips, quote, worked energetically among the other members of the congregation in which his influence was beginning to be felt to range them upon the side of liberty, notwithstanding a determination upon the part of many to remain in New York and continue the synagogue under Tory supervision. When the argument was advanced that temporary flight and the abandonment of the synagogue property might mean the final dissolution of the congregation, he, Jonas Phillips, contended that it were better that the congregation should die in the cause of liberty than to live and submit to the imposition of an arrogant government. The congregation agreed and decamped to Philadelphia, or, as is described in one history of the congregation, with the British Armada sailing for Manhattan. The community packed up the Sefer Torahs, and they fled, quote, across the plains of Harlem and Washington Heights to freedom, first in Connecticut, and then in Philadelphia, where Phillips continued his merchant business, and with war on the horizon, Jonas Phillips sensed opportunity. It is here that we find one of the most remarkable letters 
written by Jews in the Revolution period, a letter that we must read sections from. In 1776, sensing events of global transformational nature, Jonas Phillips sent a letter to a Jewish acquaintance in Holland, a man by the name of Gumpel Samson. It's a great name. People don't name their kids Gumpel anymore for some reason. Apprising his friend of the extraordinary events occurring in Philadelphia and throughout the colonies, Phillips enclosed a copy of the new Declaration of Independence. Now this letter, strangely enough, the letter that he wrote, is now in England in the London Public Records Office, even though it was written in Philadelphia and mailed to Amsterdam. Why? Because the ship bearing this letter was boarded by the British. They found Jonas Phillips' letter. They couldn't make heads or tails of it. They couldn't read it. All they could make out was what was enclosed, which was a copy of the treasonous Declaration of Independence. And so that they assumed that the eligibility, the eligibility of the letter was due to the fact that it was a patriot-coded communication. So they took it back to London for further study. Comically, of course, Phillips' letter was utterly innocuous, and the sole reason that the British were unable to read it was because it was written in Yiddish. Now, the point of this letter was that given the British embargo of America, there was plenty of money to be made through the import of goods from Holland. So let's look at this letter. So it starts out, this is Yud Bez Menachem Av, the 12th of Av, okay? So this is three days after Tisha B'Av, 1776. Anyone know the Hebrew date of July 4th, 1776? That was Shiva Asr Batamus, okay? So this is three weeks and three days following the Declaration of Independence. That's, that's when this letter is being written. And he begins, of course, because he's proposing a business deal, so he begins with flattery. And he writes, Shalom lahuvi adoni ha'alufa katsin gompo. Okay, so, hello to my master, this great man, gompo. And now he explains while, uh, why he's sending it in this roundabout way, because there's a war, he says, Al says, Val is nit meglach, is ein brief zu schicken nach England, von wegen die Muhammad in America, he spells America with a gimel. Okay, since I can't send this to you through England because there's a war in America, so Mushraiben by Veg von Saint Eustatia. I'm sending this to you through the Caribbean, through uh, through this roundabout way. And so then he says the following: Falken English as Chayra can nit a river kommen, since no English merchandise can come over. When viel Geld is zu verdienen by the Holentia Chayra, and there's a lot of money to be made from Holentia Chayra. What's Holentia Chayra? that's merchandise from Holland, so we can do a business. You'll send me goods, I'll sell it. And he says, I can promise a return of 400%. That's what he's promising, okay? So everyone, the whole British Empire is going to war, everything's coming to pieces, and he sees opportunity. That's what Jonas Phillips is doing here. And then, after making this proposal, he, in the middle of the letter, this is smack in the middle of the first, uh, why the first line, Di Melchama, and he says as follows. He starts talking about what's going to happen. Now, remember, Jonas Phillips is intensely patriotic. And he says, Di Melchama wird ganz England mechule machen. He says, the war will make all England bankrupt. Now, this is itself amazing, because who would have predicted this in July of 1776? Who would have said that America would have the upper hand, this would ultimately end up bankrupting Britain? That is what occurred. But who would have said that in July of 1776? And then he begins describing this piece of paper that he has enclosed, the Declaration of Independence. He says, The Americans haben sich schön gemacht aus wie die Städts von Holland. The Americans have made themselves like the states of Holland. Meaning, just as the states of Holland rebelled against the Spanish and then formed the Netherlands, so too the Americans have now united. And then he says about this piece of paper, D is Geschlingenen is ein Declaration von der ganze Medina. I am enclosing a declaration from the entire Medina, from the entire state. And then he continues by saying about the rest of the war, Vies wird ausgehen, Hashem is Baruch Weist. Whatever else is happening, whatever else will happen, only God knows. But he adds, De Mochama tut mir Baruch Hashem ken Hesachnitz. Baruch Hashem, the, the war is not damaging me in any way, which is important for his partner to know because he needs to know that he can send him the merchandise. And then 
he ends in the last two uh, lines of the letter, he says, Weiter kein chidushim, which is my favorite line in the entire letter. He says, nothing else is new to report. Meaning, aside from the minor thing of this massive war involving the British Empire and America, nothing else, nothing else is happening. Weiter kein chidushim. He says, my wife and children send you many, many greetings. Vincha they all wish your good health. Ad Meyashanim, till a hundred years. Why he left off the twenty from the hundred years remains a mystery. Um, so so that, I'm not sure what he did here. He says, but he says, I affront Yoina Bar Fibish Satami Busik. Yoina, the son of Fibish from Busik, that's Germany, your friend. That's the letter. Now, let us reflect on this letter for a moment. On the one hand, it seems like a classic Galut correspondence, one that could have been written by any Jew in the diaspora. Using his own language and his international familial connections, a Jew communicates to a fellow Jew about a business matter, reflecting on how world affairs would affect their deal. But there is one sentence in this letter about the document that was enclosed, meaning about the declaration, that is, I think, extraordinary. And that is Jonas Phillips' description of the Declaration of Independence as a declaration from the ganze Medina, a declaration from the whole country. It is remarkable because even though we, of course, think of America as a one nation or one country now, it's not clear that people saw it that way at all in July of 1776, even after the Declaration. So, for example, what happened when the Declaration of Independence was read throughout the streets? We know what happened in Massachusetts because Abigail Adams wrote a letter to John Adams describing it. And this is the cry that was said in the streets. Here is Abigail's letter. Last Thursday, after hearing a very good sermon, I went with the multitude into King Street to hear the proclamation for independence read and proclaimed. When Colonel Crafts read from the balcony of the State House the proclamation, great attention was paid to every word. As soon as he ended, the cry from the balcony was, God save our American States. After dinner, she writes, the king's arms were taken down from the state house, and every vestige of him from every place in which it appeared and bur was, uh, was burnt in King Street. Thus ends royal authority in this state, meaning Massachusetts. And all the people shall say, Amen. In other words, and you see this from Abigail's very words, when they read the Declaration in the streets, the people did not gather and say, USA, USA. There was no USA. The United, in the United States of America, such as a declaration from the United States of America, the United is lowercase u. United, lowercase, is an adjective, states of America. There was no USA. There was no nation indivisible. These were independent states that were rebelling against their British masters. And yet, Jonas Phillips in this Yiddish letter says something different. He calls it a declaration from the Gansa Medina, a declaration from the whole nation, which really wasn't what it was, or at least, to put it slightly differently, people didn't realize yet that's what it was at the time. But Jonas perhaps did. Jonas sees in this declaration something more, something that it would take years for much of America to recognize. He saw a declaration that did more than merely sever the bond between Britain and its colonies. He saw an articulation of an idea of equality and liberty, something which bound the states and the people of America together covenantally, one which made this document truly a declaration fun de Gansa Medina. Meanwhile, Jonas's Phillips letter may not have found its way to Gumpel Samson, but his plan to profit during the war years seemed to succeed. And by the time the war ended, he was one of the richest Jews in America and an esteemed friend of the Founding Fathers. We know this because of an incredible letter that was written by one of the founders, Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence, most famous physician in America, and second most famous Philadelphian after Benjamin Franklin. We have a letter from Dr. Rush, written to his wife, Julia Rush, describing an unusual invitation that he had received, an invitation to Jonas Phillips' daughter's wedding in the home of Jonas Phillips himself. While this may not seem unusual to us, the concept that a religious Jew in America felt comfortable invite, inviting one of the most prominent non-Jewish Americans to a profoundly Jewish ceremony in his home in 
the 1780s is absolutely extraordinary and testifies to the openness that Phillips felt at that time in American society and the prominence that he had gained in that society. The letter itself is amazing and we will be devoting a full lecture in our series of eight lectures to that wedding, to Russia's description of that wedding. Suffice it to say now that uh, with, while we'll discuss the wedding ritual and its significance later, uh, the letter does also contain uh, the greatest sentence ever written in the history of the United States because Benjamin Rush uh, writes to his wife a description not only of the chuppah but also of the mincha that took place before the chuppah. And he writes to her in the sentence he writes, As I did not understand a word except now and then an amen or a hallelujah, my attention was drawn to the haste with which they covered their heads and to the freedom with which they conversed with each other during this period of their worship. <laughs> And so uh, this is who Jonas Phillips is after the war in the 1780s. Jonas Phillips, unlike most of New York's Jews who fled to Philadelphia, Jonas Phillips, along with a couple other Jews from New York that we will meet later, such as Manuel Josephson, uh, stay in Philadelphia and found, help found a new community there, uh, the sister synagogue of my congregation, which to this day is called Mikveh Israel, as Hope of Israel, as it was then. And so this is who Jonas Phillips is in the 1780s. Now, in 1787, the very same year that Benjamin Rush attended the wedding of Jonas Phillips' daughter, the Constitutional Convention took place in Philadelphia, in Jonas Phillips' city. And Jonas Phillips wrote a letter to the convention and to the president of the convention, George Washington. It is this extraordinary letter that we must now see. Now, the point of this letter was that Jonas Phillips was writing to complain. The reason for Jonas Phillips' ire was a rule on the books in the state of Pennsylvania that in order to serve in the Pennsylvania state legislature, one must take an oath affirming that both the Old and New Testament were given by divine inspiration. And Jonas Phillips was writing to say that this was irreconcilable with the values of America and irreconcilable the values of America for which the Jews of America fought. So it was both a betrayal of the American idea as well as a betrayal of the Jews who by and large were patriots, even though New York itself was a very Tory city. And so he starts as follows. Now, the most extraordinary thing about this letter is not the text itself, though the letter itself is amazing. The most incredible thing about this letter and I've seen a copy of the original in Jonas Phillips' handwriting, is the date. Okay, if you look at the date, it begins how? Philadelphia, 24th Elul, 5547, or September 7th, 1787. That's how he writes this letter to George Washington. Can you imagine? And it says, date, 24th Elul, or if you're interested in the guyish date, September 7th. I mean, there's not a single Jew who's receiving this letter. Why is he doing this? Why is he dating it in this way? If we study the letter, we understand why he's dating this way. He writes, With leave and submission, I address myself to those in whom there is wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. They are the honorable personages appointed and made overseers of a part of the terrestrial globe of the earth, namely the 13 United States of America in convention assembled. The Lord preserve them. Amen. This is not bad, by the way, for somebody who arrived as an immigrant, right, off the boat at the age of 20 from Germany that he can write a letter like this. I don't think any of us can write a letter like this. I, the subscriber, being one of the people called Jews of the city of Philadelphia, a people scattered and dispersed among all nations, do behold with concern that among the laws in the Constitution of Pennsylvania, there is a clause, section 10, which states, I do believe in one God, the creature and governor of the universe, the rewarder of the good and the punisher of the wicked, and I do acknowledge the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by a divine inspiration. So he's quoting the law in the, in the, for the Pennsylvania State Legislature. Then he goes on to write, to swear and believe that the New Testament, he spells testament, T-E-S-T-E-M-E-N-T, -E -E that the New Testament was given by divine inspiration is absolutely against the religious principle of a Jew and is against his conscience to take any such oath. So, in this paragraph, Jonas Phillips is doing two things. 
first, of course, he's saying, this is a violation of my religious freedom. But he's doing it as a Jew, not just as a Jew living in America, but a Jew who remains linked to Jews all over the world. He calls himself a, a Jew of the city of Philadelphia, a people scattered and dispersed among all nations. But still a people. Still a people. And then he goes on to say the following. Skip one paragraph, next paragraph. It is well known among all the citizens of the 13 United States that the Jews have been true and faithful Whigs. And during the late contest with England, they have been foremost in aiding and assisting the states with their lives and fortunes. They have supported the cause, have bravely fought and bled for liberty that they cannot enjoy. That's the quote. And he says, therefore, change this, please. And I solicit this favor for myself, my children, and posterity, and for the benefit of all the Israelites through the 13 United States of America. Let's pause to ponder the audacity, the sheer chutzpah that Phillips is exhibiting here. Uh, Jews here had never had it so good. Here you have someone who's a friend of the Founding Fathers. He's wealthy, he's accepted, he's embraced. The only thing he can't do is serve in the legislature while retaining his fealty to Judaism. So what? And yet Jonas Phillips says, not only this is not right, not only unfair, and not only a lack of hakarata tov, of gratitude to the Jews who fought for America, he says, I do not have liberty. He is saying, he is audaciously arguing to the most famous man in America, George Washington, that if the Jews were not equally able to serve society without violating their conscience and their faith, then they were not truly free. Because seeking to serve society is itself part and parcel of the Jewish faith. And the essence of Jewish freedom is the ability to be part of general society while remaining dedicated to what makes us different. And here, Jonas Phillips in this letter is not only complaining and not only demanding justice for Jews, this letter is actually articulating the essence of the American idea the essence of the uh, uniquely American conception of religious liberty, and it embodies what made the Jewish experience in America different from the experience in any other nation on earth, even other nations where they achieved extraordinary success and wealth, such as in the Netherlands or in England before the revolution. You invite us to think about the story of Jonas Phillips and the claim he's making on American ideals, in this biblical phrase, stranger and neighbor, where does that come from and how do you see it illuminating what Jonas Phillips is, is asking America to redeem in its idea of liberty? The, the phrase first appears in uh, the Torah reading of Chaye Sarah, where in a very affecting scene, Abraham is seeking uh, a burial plot in which to bury his wife, Sarah. When you think about it, what Abraham is seeking is socially difficult. Because on the one hand, he needs to work together with these people. He needs them to sell him a plot. Which means, even though he's arrived from Mesopotamia, he needs them to see him, to some extent, as one of them. On the other hand, his request is a bit insulting, because he's saying, I need to purchase this plot. Because I want this to be the heritage of my family forever. Because to some ex in some sense, I'm different than you. I'm set apart from you. So the phrase, which is explicated by, by Rabbi Soloveitchik, is uh, the phrase that Abraham says to them, is, Ger I am a stranger and a neighbor among you. Tnuli achuzat kever imachem. Give me imachem with you or amongst you my own special place, which is an achuza. Achuza means something that will be a heritage for my children, that no one else will be, no other family will be bearing it, only my family. So it's a dialectical phrase and sentence because it emphasizes both what he shares with them but also what sets him apart from them. And Rabbi Soloveitchik in his essay Confrontation, uh, which was a speech delivered to the RCA originally in the 1960s during the time of Vatican II and a discussion about interfaith relations, uses that as uh, that phrase, Ger v'toshav imachem, as, as a phrase embodying the Jewish ideal, at least the Jewish ideal in the diaspora. That we seek both. We seek both to be a part of society, but also apart from society. 
And we seek to have both simultaneously, to be serving society while set apart by our faith. But he recognizes that really very few societies had offered uh, the Jewish people that opportunity and that freedom. In most societies, Jews were forced to choose. So whether it's before modernity, uh, where Jews are given the obvious choice between uh, living in a ghetto or embracing Christianity. So this is what's unique about the American idea of religious liberty. It's not merely freedom from, it's freedom to. Freedom to bring your Jewishness with you into, into the public square while you're serving society. Freedom to be both Ger and Tosha. It was Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik in his famous speech, then later published as an essay called Confrontation, who argued that to be a Jew in the world is to embody Abraham's introduction of himself before the purchase of a burial plot. For his wife Sarah, Avraham introduces himself to the nations around him as Ger v'toshav anochi imachem. I am a stranger and a neighbor among you. Which Rabbi Soloveitchik interpreted as meaning I am set apart by my faith, but I am also dedicated to working with you. And Rabbi Salvejic's point is that for centuries, Jews were forced to choose between these two duties, remaining loyal to our faith or being part of society, being a stranger and a neighbor. Even in modernity, in Europe, where Jews found freedom and emancipation to truly enter society, to truly be welcome as a part of society, Jews had to strip themselves of what made them different. Famously, Clermont Tonnerre, in the uh, French legislature, who was giving the liberal side of Jewish emancipation in France, said something like, we offer them everything as Frenchmen, but nothing as members of the Jewish nation. If they want to still contain their connection to the Jewish nation uh, and make that an, an essential part of their uh, identity in French society, then forget it. Whereas what Jews ask for, seek, and really demand is the ability to be both stranger and neighbor simultaneously to be fully contributing to American society as equals while maintaining their uniqueness not only in their homes but as they enter and participate in the public square. This is what Jonas Phillips is fighting for here. For an America in which he can serve in the legislature or remaining open about what makes him different. The ability to be both stranger and neighbor. And he says, if I can't do that, it's not enough that I pray in my shul freely and I don't have to worry about pogroms and that I can even invite founding fathers to my daughter's chasana. That's not enough. I have to be able to participate in the legislature as, not only as an American, but as a Jew and to bring my Jewish identity into the legislature, to be both stranger and neighbor. And this is why the, Jewish, the uniqueness of the Jewish experience in America is often so terribly misunderstood. What people usually say is, what's unique about America is that, Ameri is that, is that for Jews, that Jews found economic opportunity there. Or, what's unique about America is that they were able to practice their religion without being persecuted. Truth is, Jews found that in other places in the West before America. Jews had this in the Netherlands. Jews had this in England. Moses Montefiore, or uh, the Rothschilds, had vaster wealth than Jonas Phillips. What makes America unique is what Jonas Phillips is asking for and what Jonas Phillips ultimately found. Because the Constitutional Convention ultimately produced a document that did not undo at the state level the limitations. Those fell away over the next couple decades. But for the first time in the history of the West, produced a document that banned a religious test for all forms of federal, all forms of national office. And when Jews, as we'll see later in this lecture series, respond to the Constitution with gratitude and with delight, it's not because of the First Amendment. The First Amendment actually was meant to limit the national government. And the First Amendment was not in the Constitution when it was first produced. That's why it's called an amendment. What Jews loved about the Constitution was something which did not happen in England until many, many, many years later, that Jews were open, that the government was open to Jews, and that the Constitution was saying, we welcome you not only as Americans in the public square, we welcome you as Jews and as Americans simultaneously, strangers and neighbors, members of society, but religiously unique in the public square. And so I believe that Jonas Phillips' letter to Washington and the Constitutional Convention, composed several years between, before Washington's own correspondence, 
with Moses Satius of Newport, which we'll discuss as well, is one of the great letters in the history of American ideas. And it's therefore very appropriate that the first Jew to hold a major federal office was uh, Mordecai Manuel Noah, who was ambassador to Tunis in the Monroe administration. Mordecai Manuel Noah was one of the grandchildren of Jonas Phillips, the man in 1787 who argued to Washington that the equality at the heart of the Declaration from the Gansa Medina, the equality at the heart of the Declaration and the liberty at the heart of the American idea, demands not only the freedom for Jews to practice their religion in their privacy of their homes and synagogues unmolested, it demands the freedom to bring their identity into the public square. The heart of the Declaration from the Gansa Medina demands that we be able to be both part of society while remaining dedicated to what makes us different. And several years later, Jonas Phillips's loyalty to what made him different was put to the test. Phillips was called to testify in a Philadelphia court on Saturday, as courts were then in session six days a week. And Phillips refused. And Phillips explained that Saturday was his Sabbath, and that true equality demanded, I mean, we don't have this argument, but we can understand what he believed, demanded that he be allowed to obey the dictates of his conscience, the general law notwithstanding. So he refused to come to court. Stanford law professor and former appeals court judge Michael McConnell, one of the great experts in religious liberty in America, has called this case, Stansbury v. Marx, the first recorded case raising free exercise issues following the adoption of the First Amendment. So this is really, as it were, the first religious liberty case of the United States. And it features Jonas Phillips. We don't know what this case is about. All we know is the following. Here's the recording. In this cause, which was tried on Saturday, the 5th of April, the defendant offered Jonas Phillips a Jew as his witness, but he refused to be sworn because it was his Sabbath. The court, therefore, fined him 10 pounds. Now, from a halachic perspective, from a Jewish legal perspective, speaking as a rabbi, here's what I find amazing. Showing up in court on Shabbat does not really involve any violation of Shabbat. Even a Jewish court sitting on Shabbat is just a rabbinic rule. There's no violation here. Jonas Phillips didn't have to drive to court to get there. He could have gone in. He could have been sworn in. But Phillips clearly felt that if Gentile Americans honored their Sabbath by not having court, then he was obligated to equally uphold the honor of his Sabbath by refusing to testify. And it seems to me that he exhibited tremendous courage in the process. And it struck me that for us, actually for Jews, honoring the Shabbat is itself a form of testimony. Thus, the tradition to stand for at least a part of Kiddush the sanctification of the Shabbat at the beginning of every Sabbath. We stand for Kiddush based on the law that witnesses in Jewish courts stand while testifying. What this means is that in sanctifying the Sabbath, we Jews are called to bear witness to what the Sabbath stands for, the creation of the world, the Torah that reiterates the Sabbath, and the Jews who are commanded to observe it and honor it, which means that Phillips, in refusing to give testimony in a Philadelphia court, was testifying for and honoring the Sabbath. By refusing to give witness in a Philadelphia court, he was engaging in testimony on behalf of Judaism. Furthermore, in witnessing to the Shabbat in the public square, Phillips, I think, was actually showing in a uniquely American Jewish way what it means to be an American Jew and what it means to be ger v'toshav, both a stranger and a neighbor. Because the Shabbat, in a unique way, is both universal and particularistic. It embodies the unique covenantal faith of the Jews while simultaneously expressing a universal democratic idea. On the one hand, Shabbat reflects the particularistic relation between the Jews and God. We say every Shabbat, You do not give the commandment of the Sabbath to all the nations of the world, just to the people of Israel. Which means that Shabbat is a special gift to the Jews and our loyalty to the Shabbat is legendary. Uh, in the year 2000, uh, the New York Times, for its issue appearing on January 1st, 2000, not only included a copy of what the front page of the Times looked like 100 years ago, January 1st, 1900, it also included a mock-up of what the New York Times front page might look like on January 1st, 2100. So it had all these like futuristic headlines like um, robots demand human rights and uh, Cuba becomes 53rd state. Uh, and uh, brooms flying, World Cup begins, which means either uh, that in 100 years our national sport will be curling or Quidditch. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, 
Uh, but then, on the bottom of the page, in the teeny tiny letters, it said the following, something like, Jewish women light Shabbat candles today. I'll explain to the young people here. New York Times used to have the candle lighting time on the bottom. Somebody used to sponsor that. And so they put it again on the mock-up of January. They put out Nero Shabbos, lighting Hadlakat Nero time, on the mock-up of January 1st, uh, 2000. You Google this, you'll see it. Um, and they interviewed uh, the editor of the Times, and he said something like, he said, look, truth is, we have no idea what's going to happen in 100 years. But one thing we do know, that 100 years from now, Jewish women will still be lighting Shabbat candles. And so the truth is, the, the Jewish relationship with the Shabbat is legendary. Because they know 100 years from now, we'll still be observing the Shabbat. The fact is, the Shabbat on the one hand represents this unique relationship between Jews and God and our loyalty for, our sacrifice for, our faith. At the same time, by testifying the, to the Shabbat in front of a civil court, meaning by standing up not only for his faith, but for the concept of religious equality in America, Jonas Phillips was actually highlighting another theme at the heart of the Shabbat, which is human equality. If you study the text of the Torah, you note that the most famous declaration of the Shabbat was in the Decalogue, which is in Parshat Yitro in the Torah, Zachorat Yom HaShabbat L'Kadosho. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Interestingly, and on the face of it, oddly, the laws of the Shabbat is then reiterated again in the next Torah reading, in Parshat Mishpatim, the Parsha of laws, of civil laws, the laws of courts and the judicial system, which is strange because what does that have to do with Shabbat, civil laws and courts? But the truth is, the heart of the rules pertaining to Jewish courts is the equality of all before the law. That's at the heart of the Jewish notion of justice. And at the heart of Shabbat, which is a commemoration of creation and of the creation of man in the image of God, so one concept at the heart of Shabbat is equality. And so it is stressed in enunciating the Jewish notion of judicial justice because without equality, you cannot have justice. And that's why Shabbat is reiterated here because that is the first principle of the Jewish conception of equality. As one uh, Rosh Yeshiva and Yeshiva University, Rabbi Tzvi Sabolovsky, once put it, he says, quote, While we may be tempted to deny the equality we share with others, the message of the Shabbos is the remedy of this misconception. Because biblical society, I would add here, has slavery, but it is on Shabbat where we actually get a vision of a slaveless society as well. Fiyanuach ben amatechav hager, where everybody rests. Nobody can work. Everyone is treated equally. So, as Rosalowski writes, our equality with our fellow man derives from our common creator. It is the Shabbos, he writes, which instills in us the fundamental truth of the creator that enables us to view each individual properly. End quote. So what this means then is that by honoring the Shabbat in 1791, Jonas Phillips thereby expressed loyalty both to Judaism uniquely, while at the same time he embodied the proposition at the center of what he called the Declaration from the Gansa Medina, the Declaration from the entire nation. And this proposition, of course, is that all men are created equal in the eyes of God. All men are created equal because of the equal rights with which we were endowed by our Creator. All this is captured in one small line, a recording in the legal history of Pennsylvania for some obscure case where the first religious liberty case following the passage of the First Amendment involved the refusal of one Jew to testify, a Jew who happened to send a Yiddish letter with the Declaration in 1776, and who happened to send another letter, one of the great letters in the history of American ideas, to the founders at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. This is the founder of the family, that we will be discussing in the course of our lectures. And I call him the first truly American Jew, not because he was the first Jew to live in America, because he was the first Jew whose life embodies, A, what America was supposed to mean for Jews, and also what the uniquely American conception of religious liberty means, not only for Jews, for members of all faiths in America. 
that in contrast to much of the West, where emancipation was promised, genuine religious liberty in America meant not merely the ability to practice your faith unmolested, rather it is born in the recognition that your religious identity is an, and your identity for Jonas Phillips as a Jew is an essential part of who you are and you cannot amputate that from your identity when you leave your shul or your home. That you bring that with you into the public square. It is a part of you. And your religious identity cannot be a reason for limiting your full involvement in that society. And we cannot ask you to strip that religious identity from you when you enter the public square. At the heart of the, the Jonas Phillips' conception of religious liberty and the American conception of religious liberty is the ability to be both ger vitoshav, both stranger and a neighbor. That is the story of Jonas Phillips. And Jonas Phillips' story, of course, does not end there. And that brings us to the Jewish grave at Monticello. Rebecca Phillips Levy died seventh of ER. This is the daughter of Jonas Phillips. This, as we shall see further in our lectures, is the young woman whose wedding Benjamin Rush attended in Jonas Phillips' home. This is a woman who gave birth to uh, a prominent Jew in America and a naval war hero by the name of Commodore Uriah Phillips Levy who revered Jefferson's memory and ended up buying Jefferson's estate and saved it from ruin. Jonas Phillips, father of family that saved the home of the man who authored the Declaration that all men are created equal. The declaration enclosed in the Yiddish letter in 1776, a declaration to which Phillips gave new expression in his letter to George Washington. Jonas Phillips died January 29, 1803. Because Jonas Phillips not only was a patriot, but also served in the state militia during the Revolutionary War, his grave is involved in a unique ceremony that we at Sherith Israel mark. The week before Memorial Day, we visit that cemetery and we plant flags, American flags, at the graves of the members of our community that supported American independence. Usually, I reserve the right for myself or for my child uh, to plant the flag at the grave of Jonas Phillips. Because his story, while not well known, I believe speaks profoundly to us as to what it means to be a Jew in America. Jonas Phillips' story not only describes what the no nature of the American idea is, it obligates all of us. It obligates all of us in two ways. First, if we have such extraordinary freedom in America, and if we, like Jonas Phillips, do not need to sacrifice uh, or risk uh, social opprobrium or fines for refusing to, uh, for, for observing our faith, are we using this freedom to be the best Jews that we can be? And if Jonas Phillips, as a patriot, was willing to risk life and fortune and flee New York because of his dedication to America, what have we as Jews enjoying the freedom that America affords us. What have we given to America? How have we contributed to America and to society and to its ideas, both as Jews and as Americans? And how have we lived our own lives as Jews and as Americans? This is what the life of Jonas Phillips says to all of us. This is the story of a man who fathered a family that saved the home, of the man who authored the Declaration, that all men are created equal. This declaration, of course, is the one that Jonas Phillips enclosed in the Yiddish letter until 1776. It is this declaration that all men are created equal, endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, to which Jonas Phillips himself gave new expression in his letter to Washington. And to this day, Jonas Phillips allows us to understand why this declaration that he enclosed and his principles he embodied, this declaration was 
before most Americans truly understood it and remains today a declaration fun de ganze Medina. Thank you very much. Next on Jewish Ideas and the American Founders, America's Passover, Franklin, Jefferson, and the seal of the United States.